Hey, it's MJ. I hope you're well. Merry Christmas and happy AFL Fantasy launch day. Yeah, that's right. The gang at AFL Fantasy have beaten everybody else and they have launched the format first for the 2024 Fantasy footy season. We're moments away from Dream Team and Super Coach Team Pickers available. Look, chances are by the time the video is live, those formats are opened up for gold and assistant coach subscribers. But AFL Fantasy... Classic is open for everybody, ready to go. Drafts, well, keep the leagues, you can go and regenerate them. But it's time to do my way too early, 90 days away from lockout team reveal. Now, there's one quick premise before I walk you through all the 30 players that I've locked away in our $15.8 million salary cap. And there is a little bit of cash left over based on the 30 players I've got. Here's the rule I gave myself. Pick a team in two minutes. Really, it's being as intuitive and as reactive as I can. We know with these team reveals and the early season structures we do, we're going to make lots of different changes, lots of different mistakes, and try lots of different structures. But I thought, you know what? Intuitively, who comes to mind and feels like it fits within 30 players? That is the framework. I gave myself two minutes to pick players. And this is where I ended up. Let's go to the back line. In at D1, Nick Dacos. He defined seasons in 2023, and there's every chance he will do it again in 2024. But I think this time around, it's both sides of the coin around Dacos feel really valid. You've got one side of the coin that go, well, he's got a Finn McGuinness tag in the opening four or five rounds of the year, as well as a buy. Even though there's best 18 and you could probably mitigate it to some extent, in AFL fantasy, you go, nah, you know what? I'll run the gauntlet. I'll get the look and see at what happens in opening round. We'll unpack that in a second. If it doesn't damage me, I'll go against him and then I'll get him after the buy. That, honestly, that's a viable structural play. Equally, you've got people who put Dacos at D1 and go, I'm just not going to think about it for the rest of the year. And as I've talked about opening round, even though the score doesn't technically count because the format really starts in round one. If you score in opening round, it will impact your price movement. And really you'll get two for the price of one in the price movements. I've done a previous video that unpacks a little bit of this stuff around what it means. You can just click through on the link to check that video out. But I've put Dacos in my team for now for a number of reasons. One, I don't have to figure out a way to structure it. Two, if he pops a huge score in round one and a 121.30 is very, very viable for him, he's the kind of guy that I can build my structure and squad and scores around. So for me, I've locked him in for now. I wouldn't say he's locked away for the key, but D1, Nick Dacos, I'm choosing to find a way to keep him, albeit three months out before the format officially gets underway. In at D2, maybe I'm being a little hurt before it's like coming back to the ex that hurt you right Hayden Young I'm coming back to you in 2024 I owned him for lots of 2023 and it was actually okay when you look at the data he just never really ascended to the heights that I think many people expected him to in 2023 that said I'm really quite confident that Hayden Young is going to be a great pick for us this year one I think his scoring basement is super, super high, meaning he's not going to burn you if he does have another quote-unquote bad year like he did in 2023. Number two, some really encouraging signs toward the back of the year that when he moved into the midfield, he actually scored really quite nicely. And third, the fixture, it's friendly for Fremantle early days and four. Why not give four reasons? That Dockers buy right at the end just means structurally it gives you lots of versatility and flexibility about what you can do. So D2, Hayden Young. In at D3, Kitty Coleman. He's going to be a popular pick for us a lot. And I think there's a lot of reasons for why he should and will be really popular. Number one, he was dominant in the AFL final series. He was excellent. And for people that were already slightly warm, if not hot on Kitty Coleman as an option for the 2024 season, they were slightly annoyed because it just meant the general pundit is going to get on top of him. But he's been really good in patches over the past two seasons and probably just as the season went on and definitely we saw that really culminate in the finals. Yeah, this, this guy can play. 
great user of the ball, damaging with the way he takes the game on. No Daniel Rich. He really kept Daniel out of the side towards the back half of the year. He's going to get all of the ball playing through him, coming off the rebound. Him and McKenna, very, very different types of guys. McKenna's the run and gun. Coleman is the distributor of the ball. So to me, Kitty Coleman offers a lot of value based on his price point. The only little flag that you want to wave through there is he is one of eight teams that have an early buy. However, as I've already unpacked with Nick Dacos, he plays in opening round. If he drops a 90 out as a baseman, let alone gives you a 110, 120, we're going to see a significant uptick in how much money he makes early. And we might only need him for those first handful of games anyway. He's made his money and you can flip him to that premium that's ready to get moved out of your side. D4, Heath Chapman. Again, I expect he'll be a really popular guy. He's a proven guy that's shown he can score 80 plus with relative ease in this role at his price point offers plenty of value. And I've already shared a little bit about this Fremantle fixture and where his buy is, that to me, it feels like he's a really nice guy at D4. You can run right up to your buy and really safely feel confident you're going to get a 70 to 75 sort of basement. He's got some potential role versatility, not volatility, but versatility because he is best 22. There's a spot for him up on the wing should they want to use his height, speed and skills to just add a new dimension to that outside component of their team. Equally, he can come back into that back line where he really showed some scoring potential in his earlier fantasy football days. And it might even relief, you know, provide some relief and release Young back into the midfield or be less ball dominant for a Luke Ryan. So for me, at his price point, significant value, plenty of upside, happy to put him at D4. One of the most popular guys we'll see until he gets injured, and let's hope that doesn't happen, though, in teams at either D4 or D5 will be Zach Williams at over $440,000 and only just over that marker. He's a guy that you look at and just feels like, man, I'm going to get an 80 or a 75 at worst out of this, and I could get significant upside. We know Carlton have plenty of mounts to feed in the back line. But the reality is he has shown in halfback and roaming through the midfield, this guy can score in every single spot. The risk is absolutely there. Let's not downplay that whatsoever. But the fact is that risk is minimized and mitigated based on a couple of key elements. One, the price tag you're paying. Just move him to a cow if it fails, if he gets injured mid-game. Whoopie do. Two, it's mitigated by the fact that with opening round, if he doesn't score above 70, for example, if he gives you a 60 odd, he's not going to be as an aggressive at a price movement in round one with those two games combined. And with Carlton having the round two buy, you can easily jump on at round three if he does pop a monster in round one. So to me, there's a couple of that. And then third, I forecast and see, should he get through the preseason fit? And let's hope he does, that his ownership percentage will be so high that those elements combined means at least in December, you can feel relatively happy about the selection. Then my last on-field defender, Dan Curtin. Defender mid, walking straight into this Adelaide Crows best 22. I don't think he'll play a lockdown role. I think we'll see guys like Michael Laney, Hinge and Worrell play a little bit more lockdown. Butts will take the monsters while Nick Murray gets back to full health off the back of an ACL. And if anything, the absence of due date makes a real clear, easy pathway for Curtin to come in and probably be the interceptor. Uh, I don't expect much more than a 60-odd average. And even then, that would be brilliant for a guy that I think is already safely inside the Crows' best 22. And we have seen at times some relatively good scores from some of their defenders. Look back at the last few months of 2023 scoring of Miller, of Hinge, and to a lesser extent, but of Brody Smith, there's some scoring that's there. So if Curtin can get a clip of that, man, this could be one of the best defensive cows for us. Uh, speaking of cows, let's be honest, your benches in AFL fantasy at this time of year, they're just fillers until you know the guys. But for me, Show and Maker from St Kilda, Hardiman from North Melbourne, they're both guys that should get opportunities and there is a place where they could find their way early. In. But for now, they're just sitting in the placeholder. Let's move into the midfield and here is where you might see my team differentiate a lot from others. And I'll tell you the thought process behind it as we reveal the players. But in essence, it's this. There's significant value 
in our forward lines because there's, to me, not really a heap of top liners screaming, pick me. And in the middle tiers of our rucks, you can absolutely go the premiums. But to me, there's enough value in the rucks that feels for me, I can get uber aggressive, spend up big on the midfielders and not have to chase as much value. It's a genuine strategy, I think, that could work for us in 2024 in AFL Fantasy. In at M1, Andrew Brayshaw. He was awesome last year in what was statistically and, and from a narrative perspective in the community, a down season. But he was awesome last year. Run the data back. If a down year is delivering the average that he did, count me in for another bad year. The upside, I've already talked about the fixture for Fremantle, where that buy placement is, but also Caleb Sarong has become much more the tag target now, given his impact per possession is so much greater than Brayshaw. They're still in a fantasy format of how Fremantle, don't say those three F words fast or you'll get demonetized on YouTube, but you put those things together and all of a sudden for me, I go, you know what? I feel like I could pretty easily put the C or VC on Brayshaw every single week. So for me, yeah, it does go against some of the intuitive nature of AFL fantasy. We were always looking for value, but I think there's enough elsewhere that we can go straight to the top of the tree and not fart around with flipping some of the top end mids. It's why then at M2, I've got Rory Laird with the exception of round one last year. Awesome. And that is a career anomaly. It's not like we can build too much narrative around what he is in round one. But the reality is one of the safest 90 plus scorers we've got going in the game. Almost impossible to stop him going for 100 outside of an injury narrative that pops and hits his way. So having a Brayshaw and a Laird at M1 and M2 just means for me, I've got two guys that I'm very confident will be in the top five scorers overall let alone in the midfield. I've got a weekly walk-up VCC option without even really having to look at any of the other 28 options I might have in my side. Imit M3, I feel like I've got to get him in every preseason reveal, but it's not just because I love my boy. There's a genuine reason to pick Josh Kelly. Yep, I found a way to get him into the team reveal under $900,000. And yep, undoubtedly had a really disappointing back end of the year. Some would say that's partially linked to a role adjustment and there's definitely data that's there, but there are two significant games, one against Willem Drew and Port Adelaide, the second against Finn McGuinness and Hawthorne, where he was really shut down out of the game. And there is a lot of moments where structurally then, GWS went, right, well, if Kelly can't be here and we're not losing that, let's remove the tagger out of the game by moving Kelly out and putting another ball winner in. So is it causation or correlation that, that meant those two scores? That's something we can debate. But look at that front half of the year. Yes, GWS weren't at their best, but there's 110 scoring consistently there. That ceiling we, I know and you know we all love of Josh Kelly is still there. So he might not last. I hate to say it. Oh, I've got a bit emotional thinking about that. He might not last, but we've got a ton of these just under $900,000 guys. We'll talk about a few more in a second, but he's right in the mix. Again, the early buy doesn't really favor him, but there's a narrative where you can go Kelly and then flip and move. And again, best 18, they're pretty easy to navigate best 18 when you've got the most available squad options early in the year. It's not like round 20 where you're trying to get to 18 on field still sometimes or 22 on field. You should have your most available options early. So man, maybe you can afford to hold a premium or two. Who knows? early days. But Josh Kelly for me at the moment, it took me two minutes and maybe it's my confirmation bias, but I'm going for him anyway. In at M4, we'll keep powering through. Jack Steele, another one of these guys that is probably more the traditional AFL fantasy midfielder that you start with. Has got a legacy history of going 110 plus over multiple years, but he's priced in this 90s range, which gives us not just 10 to 15 points per game of value, but just saves us that $100,000 where you might not go the Rory Laird traditionally or the Brayshaw traditionally. You get the guy who will be within five, five points per game of them, but he's 100000 cheaper and you take it. For me, everything went wrong for Jack Steele in 2023. At worst, I think all he does is what he's at. 
But for me, very, very happy right now to look at Jack Steele at M4. There's a bunch of them. There's LDU. Uh, there's Tuke Miller is another one. There's Steele. There's a ton of them. Even this one, got M5. I told you I was rolling deep. Sam Walsh. History says he's a 105 guy. I think the fantasy community knows a 110 averaging season is on the way. He showed moments of it when he came back from an interrupted preseason, then did nothing for a chunk of the year, got injured. But by the time he got back in come finals, that's where we started to see the Sam Walsh we know and love. Again, we talk about a guy that's got mid-90s price point, but has another 10 to 15 points per game of upside. That is absolutely Sam Walsh. The only big flag around starting him, round two buy. Do you really want to have a guy that you've picked for one week and then you don't have the next? Again, already shared this a bit about Kelly. Is there a world where you target him in round three and you just go, no, nah, I'm going to bank it? Or do you go, I'm going to bank him from the start, hope I get a good opening round score in round one, blossom some of that income in and project his price up a little bit, and then go, it's round two. I'll be able to get to a best 18, and I've got the guy that I think is the best value midfielder that could become a premium. It's not as cut and dry as what I'm hearing in the community. I'd love to hear a bit more conversation in and around holding a premium or almost premium through these early buys. We'll do that for you in the preseason if you don't hear it anywhere else. Let's keep rolling through the rest of the mid in at M6, opening up the DPP link with Elijah Sardis. Uh, under $500,000. This guy, I think, presents massive value. Again, another traditional style AFL fantasy pick. Some might be tempted to put him in the forward line. For me, you'll see the forwards in a sec. I've decided to put him into the midfield at this stage. I think he could walk uh, after the five maybe anywhere from round five to round eight. Again, he's got another early of these buy rounds that we talk about of teams. He feels like the kind of guy after round eight, he could genuinely be averaging 85, 90. He's just got that skill set about him. Good ball winner, good user on the outside, nice bit of skill. And I really liked what I saw from him late in 2023. So he's in there for me. Then we hit the cash cows. Colby McKercher, I think he's going to be one of the best cash, cash cows for us in 2024. Number two pick in the AFL draft. Absolute ball dominant player at every level of football. And from a fantasy perspective, has been an absolute beast. One of the best you could possibly get for us this year. I'm not a huge fan of always paying up to the top dollar for our cash cows without guarantee that I think I'm going to get more extracted scoring out of them. I don't like just paying for job security, but I think with Colby McKercher, we can feel pretty confident about that. Riley Sanders wraps out my on-field side. I think, unfortunately, the injury to Bailey Smith has just created a little bit more opportunity for Riley, who was probably in their best 23 anyway, and that's due to his skill set and speed and athleticism. So to me, I'm really, really happy at this stage to put Riley there. And if there's cheaper options that I believe will score comparable during the season proper, happily take that $30,000, $50,000, $80,000 saving. Last two players I've got on my bench. I'm pretty confident with these guys, by the way. Jeremy Sharp was a son, now a docker, under $300,000, which is our limit of what we would deem a cash cow. To me, I think he walks straight into that side. The wing spot is open for discussion with Liam Henry leaving the squad. And I think Sharp has shown at times at Gold Coast, he actually could score really well in the right style of gameplay. Good runner, decent user of the ball, fits that Frio game style perfectly for me. Happy to check him on the bench. And then Harry Dimitia. We love Harry. Collingwood player, longtime supporter of the coaches panel too. We love you, Harry. Um, just got to get our boy. He is our rookie boy of this class. So Harry, you're in. Of course, I would never betray you, my friend. You are in. Let's head to the rucks. So how did I find a way to get so heavy and deep through the midfield? Actually, it's pretty simple if you're not going at the top end of the rucks. And you can build a genuinely good case for an English, for a Marshall, for a Gorn. You can build a really good, compelling narrative for any of those three. But I think we'll see a really popular starting at least December and January, while we're still unsure what's happening with exact movements of players, I think we'll see a really popular strategy this year is looking for value in the ruck line. And the beautiful thing is we've got some great options. In at R1, I've got Brody Grundy. He's got a history of going 120 plus, showed last year when he rucked on his own. He's still got 100 capacity within him. He probably will never get back to those absolute beast mode days where he's rivaling the number one or is the number one scorer in the game. But at Sydney, 
that ruck spot is his. His significant value, a minimum of 20 points per game of upside, potentially upwards of 40 to 45 if we really want to stretch it. To me, I can see Brody Grundy as one of the most selected players in fantasy. And right alongside him, Tristan Cherry at North Melbourne. No Goldie means that ruck spot is his. Shown in spurts and moments that not just from our points per minutes, but when he is the number one lead ruck, this guy can really score. He'll give you the pathway really quickly to an English, to a Marshall, and hopefully quick enough where you can get them at their lowest price point for the year, maybe even a max score should you so desire it. But for me, Cherry, I've got in there. I think this is going to be really popular and potentially a really vanilla uh, structure through the rucks, but sometimes vanilla is good. It gives you the opportunity to go and build elsewhere. We keep talking about these interchange guys. They don't really matter, but they're guys that I think you should keep an eye on at least. Uh, Harry Barnett, ruck forward. That's primarily the reason I've got him. He's a long way behind a couple of others in that West Coast side, but he's a ruck forward that might get some games. Pretty simple. Let's get to the last line before we wrap up this video in my team reveal. I'm spending more time explaining every player selected than I did picking a whole 30 players. Jack McRae, I've got in at F1. Honestly, start of this week, might not have picked Jack. But unfortunately, with the injury to Bailey Smith, it's given me and I think a lot of the community now a little more confidence to select Jackson McRae in our starting squads. That might get completely blown out of the water once we get into the preseason proper. But the reality is it's just one less option that could flip and spin through this midfield unit. I know Bailey didn't play a lot of midfield minutes in the back half of the year, and that didn't be helpful for McRae anyway because he wasn't doing great towards the end of the year. But the reality is I, I think Jackson offers so much upside for us that at very much the very much minimalistic moment right now, we should be going, all right, what do we structurally look like with a guy who's got one 10 plus multiple years at a 90s price point? At the very least, you've got to look at it during this December, January, February period until we get something more definitive that rules him out. So for me, um, probably wasn't going to pick him at the start of the week, but now, unfortunately, with the news of Bailey out, Jackson, I feel really comfortable to jump in. In an F2, he'll be a popular one at F2 or F3, maybe even F1, depending on how people structure. Taylor Adams, he is unbelievable value for us. There's no injury discount. It's rather he had a role impact during the year that meant he didn't spend enough time through the midfield, which is one, how we've got him to pick up mid forward DPP, but two, how we've been able to get him at such potential value. He's gone to Sydney with the promise of getting back into that midfield. And so for me, the only real risk that is around Taylor Adams as a selection is his fitness and his unfortunate injury history. The good news is he played pretty much the entire home and away season last year. I know he missed the premiership because of an injury, but the reality is he's the kind of guy where looking at our forward lines going, there's not many 90 plus guys that we feel confident on to start and invest that early salary cap. Taylor's got pedigree over numerous years at number of clubs that when he plays as an inside mid, this guy can score. So yep, injury risk, no doubt. One nick in the preseason, he's probably out of the mix. But at the start of the year, you're looking for value. You want a way to stock up in another line for me, which was the midfield in this team reveal. Taylor Adams might be the ticket. Then it's all looking for upside. Who are guys that could go 85 plus over the first six, eight, 10 weeks of the year? Give me 10, 15, 20 points per game of value and maybe just push the top tier while I wait for, God willing, some potential forwards that are good that land in the game. And I've just picked a couple of guys that I think the roles could be there and are conducive to scoring and have shown it previously. In at F3, Josh Rochelle. Uh, he's got a awesome history of scoring tons in round one. So hoping for three for three from Josh, but also there's a need for his speed, um, his speed, his power and his class through that midfield for the Crows. And he's coming into that third year where it really is time for him to start picking that up with Rankin coming into the club. There's not as much of a need for his dynamic X factor inside the forward line only is now they're able to kind of use him in both of those hybrid moments. So for me, I'd really, and we saw it last year too. We saw a 
really nice stretch. I think it's over the six, eight games of the year to start the season. Him going 85 plus in his average, a couple of tons through there. So another start like that, yes, please. Josh, I think could be a really handy starting squad. It's no crows bias, I promise but he's definitely in there. Uh, in and there for similar narrative, Zach Fisher moved from Carlton to North Melbourne. They've lost a lot of distributors off halfback with Hall and Zebel, And there've been some preseason talk that even Harry Sheasel might find his way to the center part of the ground so he can be a bit more damaging with the impact of scoreboard and maybe play him a bit more center forward rather than just rebound. Regardless of that, Fisher's coming to that side to add some speed, some skill, and hopefully hold down that halfback line. If he does, two things could really happen. One, open up that DPP link, which we know for trading and in-season versatility, especially with that utility position is really, really helpful. Second, he showed at Carlton, the guy can score 85 pluses in this role. And I'll take an 85 plus from a guy under 700,000 in a line that really is a hot mess of guys that are right at that top end, especially in comparison to what we got in 2023. A guy I've got at F5, that I think is going to be really, really popular, but, but is he best 22? That we've got the preseason to figure out. Finn McRae, I am doubling the McRae's in my forward line. Lots has been talked about him in the off season. The coach loves him. I'm not so sure that the Adams out McRae in narrative that got trotted out a little bit through October is going to hold. I think if he's going to get there, there are other movements and nuances rather than just Adams out McRae in. I think if Finn's coming into the side and for him to score anything of value for us in the fantasy community, it's got to be as a foot, not as a forward, but as a midfielder. So for me, Finn McRae, I'm putting him at F5. And the beauty is at his price point, I can drop down to pretty much any cash cow I like. And that's also the same reason I've picked Harley Reid at F6. I'm actually not convinced that he's going to be a monster scorer for us. I, I think a player of his power and skill will be a really good footballer. But at West Coast, is he going to be the guy that trots out a 70-plus average? We say it so baseline-y, but we've become so accustomed in AFL fantasy, haven't we, that these high-end kids just from game one, pump out scores. Sheasel gave us a ton last year. Dacos the year prior. Ashcroft. Wardlaw, if it's a mid-season guy. Uh, Ruben Jinby last year. We're so used to these top-end picks being worth paying up to hold. Is Harley Reid going to be that? I actually don't know, but I've got the salary cap there. I've still got a ton of cash. If you go and put this exact team into AFL Fantasy for yourself just to see how much cash. There is still way more cash than I'm accustomed to having in a team reveal. So having him at F6 just feels like I'll get it. And if I can drop down, happy days. Last three spots, I'm including the utility to wrap us up. Uh, are just a couple of guys that probably should get games based on the clubs and the positions they've got. Johnston and Hall at West Coast and Amana are over at Geelong. Mature age, sure, mid forward, but Gosh, they've got a really good history, <laughs> Tim Kelly, of picking up mature age guys and turning them into decent scorers. So for me, that is who I've got in my 30. So what was the premise I set for the start of this for you? Pick a team in under two minutes. I've explained them in a lot longer than that. But comment below, but let me know who of these players are you absolutely locked into and who of them are you like, this is the worst pick ever. In fact, tell me your number one pick. Who did you pick first in each line? Comment below uh, this video. I'd love to know who are your locks in every single line. Give me one player. I can't wait to hear it. Over the next couple of days, as the team pickers of Supercoach and Dream Team open up, we will bring you a similar way too early team reveal and have a look at my team. And then don't forget, January 1, we kick off the 50 most relevant. It's not just AFL fantasy based. It looks at all of the formats for your salary cap formats of the game and i tell you in a daily video an audio podcast and an article at coachespanel.tv who i think are the most relevant players in 2024 a number of them are in this squad and a bunch of them aren't who and why you'll find out during the 50 most relevant. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. We really appreciate it. If you're just new to the channel and haven't subscribed, make sure you do that. Got those notifications turned on. So as soon as another video drops this preseason, you'll be notified straight away. Thank you so much for watching. We greatly appreciate it. We can't wait to chat with you again soon as we discuss AFL Fantasy and all other fantasy formats heading into the 2024 preseason.